closing the keynote with uh, Josh. I asked him how to introduce him, and he just said, uh, I'll keep it short, so that's what I will do. Josh Gorman. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, how are you liking the conference so far? Pretty good job. Round of applause for them. Okay. <clears throat> so I have, I have a lot of respect for this audience. And as such, last night when we were talking, I had to rewrite half my slides and maybe put too much content in because we had a lot of good conversations and I realized I should probably put more in. Um, one of the reasons I have a lot of respect for this community is that, well, you'll see in a moment, but what we're doing has far greater consequences than why we first got into this. And I take security incredibly seriously. I think it has tremendous impact on public safety, human life, civil liberties, et cetera. And we have to be ready ambassadors and translators and educators to make sure that we're helping equip the people who write digital infrastructure to do a really good job at it. And it's a really hard problem, and there's a tremendous amount of technical supply in this community. Um, what has been missing is cultural demand. Everything is supply and demand, and we haven't had enough cultural demand. And why I'm optimistic about things like DevOps or um, the cultural changes being done in that community is that it's a chance to rewire how we team up with and contribute to those groups. Uh, it's at a time in history when we really have to do it. So while the title is Continuous Acceleration, and I do intend to talk about the opportunity that DevOps represents, Gene Kim and I have been working on this for at least five or six years now, and we've been fully embraced. Um, and that means you too can be fully embraced if we seize the opportunity. But that window is closing. So there'll be some urgency in my tone because I respect you guys. Um, so I have a couple different hats. Um, first and foremost, I want to make the world a safer place. So most of the things I do on my nights and weekends are to try to raise the threat IQ or the education on things like defensible infrastructure, secure code development. It's one of the reasons we wrote the Rugged Software Manifesto a few years back. Um, I've also more recently started a group you'll hear about called I Am the Cavalry, which is a terrible, terrible name, and yet kind of fitting if you hear a little bit more information about it. And we're squarely focused on public safety and human life. And uh, in my day job, I'm the CTO for Sonatype. Uh, I took over as custodian for all the Java open source code in Maven Central, Nexus, and, and I'm trying to make sure that the safe thing to do is also the easy thing to do in tool chains that developers consume, right? We have to meet them at their level and make sure we're equipping them for what they care about. Uh, and I also have way too much of a fascination with zombies for some reason, I don't know. <clears throat> um, I just want to spend a few minutes on motivations, right? We're all motivated differently, and a lot of us get into security for very different reasons, but you have to understand motivations. Any plan or strategy you have that depends upon human nature changing is a plan that's going to fail. You have to know what people care about, and we can't give them something that we care about. We have to meet them in, within the context of their own incentive structure. So whether you're motivated from fear or from greed or from love or for hate or because you want to uh, be a rock star, when I look at the hacker motivations, I basically boil them down to the original motivation was curiosity. How does this thing work? Can I take it apart and put it back together? We like to solve puzzles like the Rubik's Cube. Then there's the people who want to be a rock star. They want to be famous. It's for ego or pride. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's just that's how they're motivated. Then there's the people who want financial gain. It's very lucrative, and they may even go into the dark side of the gray markets and black markets where they'll be financially motivated. For me, I want to be the guy making the world a safer place, so I do it for altruistic type protector reasons. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. I mean, truth be told, I think primarily I want to protect things, and secondarily I like the challenge, right? So I don't know why you got into it, but you do what you do because of what you care about. And the same is true for the people we want to influence and, and change. And if we understand what they care about, we'll be more successful. And what I realize is that empathy is the killer app, the core success factor to why DevOps works, why the cavalry is working, why we're getting anything positive change is not our technical skills, it's developing soft skills. So let me get to the, the topic of the day. So had everyone seen this book or this phrase before? Um, I can't see this and read the intended meaning. What it really means is that software is eating the world, and no matter what kind of company you are, you're becoming a software company. Now, if this is true, and I think most people would agree it is true, um, then he who owns the most developers wins, right? Developers become the most precious commodity on earth. 
not just developers, but the best developers become the, the most precious resource that you can get in this game. But I can't see it this way. I'm a security guy. I've been doing security for a very long time. I don't look at it as software is eating the world. I see it's infecting the world. We're putting software and connectivity into every aspect of your life. You're going to see in a minute there's 100 million lines of code or more in your automobile. Your refrigerator is connected. Insulin pumps and medical devices are connected. Industrial control systems are running vulnerable software that's unpatchable, running nuclear facilities. So I see this as spreading like the plague, right? Now, maybe you do as well. The Internet of Everything to me is the Internet of Hackable Things. Now, we wouldn't do it though, right? We clearly adopt these things for their obvious immediate benefits. But I think what we're forgetting is that everything is a cost benefit, a risk reward, a trade-off. And I couldn't come up with a good metaphor, and I still can't, but I had to fix my, my deck, my patio, where we eat you know, lunch in the summertime. And I had to buy nails that were galvanized. Do you know why we galvanize metal? It's to prevent rust. But do you know the trade-off of galvanizing metal? It makes it brittle. The nails bend very easily. And I would rather we look at software not as it's awesome and like everything's better with bacon, everything's better with Bluetooth. That's pretty much how the medical device guys look at Bluetooth. I'd rather look at it like when we want the benefit software can provide, we do it. And when we can't afford the consequences or risk, we don't do it. And right now we're in a mode where we're putting software and connectivity on everything, assuming it's good. Now this is actually becoming a really serious public health issue, right? You can't have a slide deck here without Heartbleed in it, right? So I'm as guilty. Um, but Heartbleed wasn't the first one that caught my attention that we had a public uh, safety issue or public health issue in our software supply chains. Uh, the first one that really caught my attention was Apache Struts, and we'll look at that in a moment. But I want to make a few observations about Heartbleed. Um, not only was it just a level five severity, which you all know, but what people didn't pay attention to is it was one of 31 separate CVEs found that year. So when there's a little blood in the water, shark circle, and this is just the white hat research community unveiling and revealing these new vulnerabilities. But we've long had this false belief that with open source, many, with many eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. We believed that open source was almost infallible. And I'm not digging on open source. You're gonna see later I'm just as hard on closed source. But what we realized is with everyone depending upon this, when there is a vulnerability, it amplifies and magnifies the weakness. Now, I would be okay with it, except for the fact that on day one, Rob Graham scanned the internet and found 600,000 nodes directly responding as vulnerable. Within one month, the first half of those got fixed. It's been over a year now, and there's still, the remaining 50% are both unpatched and unpatchable. A lot of these systems can't be patched. They're an embedded software or firmware, and they're in devices that you really can't do anything about. So we get the benefits of the open source. We also get the shared attack surface and the shared risk. And when we dig into them, some of them are unpatchable because they're industrial control systems. I'm not picking on Siemens here. Siemens as an industrial control manufacturer, the same one that was affected by the Stuxnet virus, even though we have air gaps, right? Uh, they were vulnerable to open SSL. But to their credit, they admitted they were vulnerable and they were patchable. Some of their competitors did not admit it and were not patchable. These are pretty serious use cases where they're both vulnerable and cannot be remediated. But you know, the, the more troubling thing is we've now had confirmation of that open SSL version being present in medical devices, in nuclear facilities, in automobiles. Codenomicon confirmed it's in at least one automaker and a separate autom automotive um, OE um, supply chain for the technology packages privately told the cavalry that they too are vulnerable. Now it's one thing for them to depend on that software. It's another to, to if they don't have a robust way to notice they're compromised, to respond to failure, and to do something about it, especially when life and limb is on the line. And then there's shell shock, et cetera. We, we're having more and more. So the right way to look at this, I'm just going to bring you back to when the, the, the big earthquake happened in Haiti. Do you guys remember that? There was a lot of international coverage. There was a lot of international relief. Several world leaders flooded in. Uh, and it was basically a 7.0 Richter scale earthquake. And it killed 230,000 people. That's a six-figure death toll. Very devastating. That's why it was on the news for weeks and weeks and weeks. But what got very little coverage is six weeks later in Chile, there was a much, much stronger earthquake. It was an 8.8 .8 Richter scale, but it only killed 279 people. Now, the difference in death count is stunning, and it was studied mercilessly, and if you could ogle at the information graphic later, 
of all the contributors like population density, the number one contributor to the reason why a smaller earthquake had more death were building codes. Haiti did not have modern building codes and building standards. Chile did. So where Chile saw cracks in foundations, Haiti saw buildings completely pancake and kill everybody inside. So it dawned on me, it's not the presence of an earthquake, it's not even the magnitude of the earthquake, it was the existence of sufficient building codes. And I ask you, is it the presence of an attacker or the magnitude of the attacker, or is it that we have insufficient or we lack building codes for building software code? And this is why I want to turn to the software supply chain. Now, many years back, I wrote the Rugged Manifesto. Some of you made fun of it. Some of you liked it. It really wasn't meant for you. It was meant to be like a doctor's have a Hippocratic oath or a creed that they stick to, a first do no harm. We wanted to write a Hippocratic oath for developers who didn't yet know about the awesome responsibility that comes with writing digital infrastructure. So I'm going to read you one line that you guys tended to like, which was, I recognize my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. As we depend more on software in areas that affect public safety and human life, I think this is becoming clearer. Now, the, the ones the developers liked was right above it. I recognize my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate, in ways it was not designed and for longer than ever intended. Some of the people who have actually put lives in danger, when we pointed out how their code was, be, was being used, they said, oh, we had no intention of that code being used that way. So we were supposed to be behind a firewall on some pointless system. So this is the nature of writing digital infrastructure. Now look above you, okay, I've done this exercise before. This building is made of steel and concrete. Not one of you sat here in perpetual fear that the building was going to crush you, right? We've become able to depend upon steel and concrete as foundational to human culture. We are becoming as dependent on software, but it's not nearly as dependable. In fact, as you guys know, it's infinitely vulnerable. And we have to do something about that. So one of our beliefs and problem statements, which kind of rugged and rugged DevOps have turned into is this notion that our dependence on connected technology is growing faster than our ability to secure it, and we've now put it into things that can affect public safety and human life. So at DEF CON two years ago, we're almost two years old, uh, we said, look, we're going to try to be a voice of reason and technical literacy to educate the public, public policymakers, and these industries um, on the nature of cyber risks and cybersecurity. And we went after medical devices, automotive, um, public infrastructure, including airplanes, and um, home IoT, or the Internet of Things. And each one of them has different dynamics, but we've aggressively been trying to be a helping hand instead of a pointing finger. We're focused on not on past failure, but on future success. We're not red teaming. We're helping with secure architecture design threat modeling. And we're trying to change the incentive structure so that the laws and the insurance agencies and the way they approach their dependence on software is one that affects public safety and human life. And you're the talent pool that has to help with that. You might not have woken up today saying, I'm going to help make sure that people don't get hacked in automobiles. But we're the, the only people, the cavalry isn't coming. That's half the name, right? What we did is we got as high and deep as we could in our respective governments. We worked with Europe. We worked with the US. We worked with private sector. We kept looking for the adults. And we couldn't find any. So when you know that no one's coming to save you, it's simultaneously devastating. But it's also empowering. Because if the cavalry isn't coming, it's you. So when I say I am the cavalry, it's not Josh. It's something you're supposed to say. If you feel like you can fill a void, fill it. And we've had a couple hundred folks step up and try. Our attitude is just like lean and agile. We're going to fail fast and iterate. We're going to experiment. We're going to fuzz the chain of influence. And we're going to see what can happen. And thus far, we've done some pretty cool things. So I wasn't going to include this, but I am now, because I want to really drive home where they're at in their maturity level. So this is excerpts from a presentation we did in Detroit with a bunch of the international automakers about safety. <clears throat> so everybody knows Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek. A lot of you guys respect them. Let me tell you something. The automotive industry hates their guts. They hate them because they were a PR crisis and a nightmare, and they created embarrassment, and they triggered antibody response. Now, you can love or hate them, but they did strike with the conversation. And despite what they do with their research and whether Detroit likes it or not, we can at least complement their actions. But the idea was they're proving that these new connected vehicles are unsafe at any speed. And if you haven't seen the videos, they can shut off the brakes, turn the steering wheel without the driver. Really scary stuff. Now, what I'd like to remind them, though, is even if that's sensational and stunt hacking and Detroit thought it was lowbrow or reckless, um, whatever verbs you want to use, 
all systems fail. So let's just talk about the facts, right? We have computer science backgrounds. We understand the nature of things. And what I pointed out is, well, first off, is there anybody in this audience that doesn't think a car is going to get hacked? Because some of the worst critics of this idea are from the very security community who break things within minutes after trying. Anybody here? Okay. So one of the things we have to get back to for first principles is that there's a certain number of defects per thousand lines of code. We know that. It doesn't matter who wrote it. There's a range of defects per thousand lines of code. And what people don't realize is not only are cars computers on wheels, they're running over 100 million lines of code now. Right? Some of these cars have more lines of code than the Windows XP operating system. That's a significant amount of complexity, guys. So of course that code has flaws, and one flaw can be exploited, and if that's exploited in the right way through accidents or adversaries, you're going to have a bad day. Now that's not necessarily new. What's becoming new is that the amount of remote access technology to that software is exploding. So it used to be you had to have physical access to the car, which is kind of a boring threat model. But now that you can do it over Bluetooth, over near field, over a USB port, over GPRS over uh, 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspots standard in many of the vehicles, they're adding more and more attack surfaces with varying amounts of range in a very troubling way, any one of which gives you access to the CAN bus, which gets you access to pretty much everything if you know how the architecture of a car works. They're very flat, open networks. And what's becoming worse, and people didn't know at dinner, is that a lot of these cars have app stores with third-party applications running the same memory space and once compromised, or if it's an evil app, can disable the brakes if they can talk across that CAN bus. So this isn't funny, right? And part of it's our fault because we've allowed the outside world to think that we're doing a pretty good job at security, right? Every time you see a, a retailer breach, somebody claims that if they were merely PCI compliant, the breach wouldn't have happened, which we know is nonsense. But the outside world thinks that we're doing a pretty good job. So when I talk about all systems fail, let me just take a moment here. <sighs> Tell me I'm wrong. 100 of the Fortune 100 companies have had a material loss of intellectual property, trade secrets, or sensitive organizational data in the last two years. Failure rate's about 100%. Another stat. Every single retailer that was PCI compliant has had a breach of, of credit card data, despite being PCI compliant. So the failure rate's nearly 100%. Now, we don't go around saying, wow, we're abject failures. Because in the credit card world, for example, 4% loss per year is an acceptable loss. So I ask you, with your kids and your wife and your husbands and driving around in the vehicles, is a 4% increase in annual loss acceptable in your car? It's not even that simple because we spend $80 billion US per year protecting credit cards and we spend nothing protecting this, this system. We place an awful lot of trust on a going forward basis. So a lot of people usually devolve to, well, they wouldn't hurt you, there's no money in it, because they think the only motivation for an adversary is money. Um, there's a whole pantheon of adversaries, right? In a threat modeling, the very first adversary is Murphy from Murphy's Law. It's accidents and adversaries. There's just simply unintentional use. But as you saw from the morning keynote, um, some extremist groups have graduates from computer science programs from prestigious universities in their ranks. And if not, they certainly have the money to pay Romanian hackers just like the rest of us do, right? So I'm not comfortable hoping they wouldn't hurt me. I want to know that they couldn't hurt me. There was a time when they couldn't. And uh, Dan Gear is one of my mentors, and he likes to say, on the internet, every sociopath is your next door neighbor. So I ask you, if one, are you trusting every human being on Earth? Because I don't know what the motivation was for the Charlie Hebdo guys. It wasn't money. I don't know what the motivation was for the Boston Marathon bombers. I don't know what the motivation was for the kid who shot up his school in Connecticut. There's some bad people in the world, and we're increasingly giving bad people a way to assert their will onto you and your family. Now, in the US, there's a poorly written law coming. Um, we're hoping to improve it, but they're trying to start regulating safety in the vehicles. And it doesn't matter which country does it first. The vehicles sold to any of these countries, they're going to still adhere to the same kind of safety standards. So what we want is the geeks to influence these to be better. There's also some class action lawsuits. After they saw Charlie Miller's videos, they want to sue them for negligence. So what we've done in the Cavalry, just really briefly, is we published a, on our first birthday at DEF CON last year a five-star automotive cyber safety framework to meet them where they are. And the basic idea is that if you add connected software to anything, whether it's a toaster, a car, or a medical device, these are the five foundational capabilities you need towards failure. If you remember, point zero is all systems fail. Then those are the formal names for the five. And we have a very detailed overview of what this stuff means. 
But basically, it's how do you avoid failure? How do you take help avoiding failure? How do you notice and learn from failure? How do you respond to failure? And how do you contain and isolate failure? If you're going to add software and connectivity, once you decided to touch the internet, you are responsible to do these five things so that you can manage the life cycle of failure. So let me define them briefly. Safety by design, do you have a published SDL? It could be a bad one, but will you tell your customers the steps that you take to ensure you've eliminated elective failures and make them safe? Of course, you're going to miss things. So it's third party uh, collaboration. Do you have a published attestation of your third party uh, coordinated disclosure policy? This could be through BugCrowd or HackerOne or on your own, but basically it's a welcome mat instead of a beware of dog sign. Right? Now, right now, if you look at what's happening with Chris Roberts, there's a whole bunch of different things going on with the airlines, but um, they don't typically have coordinated disclosure policies, and they look at any researcher as a threat. Um, that's slowly changing. In fact, United did post a bug bounty shortly after they banned him from flight, but that's a little more complicated of a story. The third one is evidence capture. You know, for any of these things that can cause public safety and human life issues, you have a black box, right? You have the the international group of the NTSB who try to study every single plane crash to figure out what happens so the entire industry gets smarter. So at the moment, you have the automakers simultaneously screaming that there is no evidence of hacking when none of them have any evidence collection to notice if there was hacking. So we want to fix that circular lie and make sure there's some form of tamper evident forensically sound evidence capture. With security updates, this is a big one. but. Uh, if you're compromised, can you do a prompt and agile response? Right now, Tesla can do over-the-air updates, BMW, I think Mercedes is one, and Ford announced they're going to do it, but a lot of them are very reticent and reluctant to do this. But if you can't do an easy update, uh, your response time might not be measured in hours or days. It may be measured in months or years. So think about you know, the software updates we do all the time. Can it be done badly? Of course. Is it better to have one? Absolutely. And then segmentation and isolation, it, it would scare the bejesus out of you to know how connected these systems are. So compromising the radio should only allow you to mess with the radio, but unfortunately, there are sharing similar CAN bus and, and uh, communication layers so that you can get pretty much anywhere. There's a couple car companies trying to introduce some physical and logical isolation mechanisms, but we're basically asking us to tell you so that you can have a flooding or a failure in one system that is contained and isolated solely to that system. Right. So these are things we want the auto industry to learn from us. Right? We have a lot of experience of failing, and we want to understand, teach them how to fail better. We did a success story on the BMW hack. A lot of us made fun of BMW, but not the cavalry. What we basically said is a third-party researcher brought this to them. They didn't sue them. So that's at least the spirit of star number two. Um, they noticed that you could man in the middle um, unlock systems through the, the uh, equivalent of the OnStar system. Um, so what they did is they patched it over the air because they had over the air update capabilities and their customers were patched before they even know they were vulnerable, which meant the bad guys couldn't take advantage of it uh, quick enough. And number three, in the process of doing so, they noticed they were passing their updates over the air in the clear. And if you went to Jim Manico's presentation and you understand the necessity of secure socket layer and TLS, um, they were encouraged both to add HTTPS and then tell the public in public statements so that other car companies would not make the same mistake. So even though they did a terrible job and were hacked, we don't want to focus on what they did wrong. We want to encourage better behavior, and they're fueling an upward spiral of learning and improving. And that's, at this point, all we can ask for. Notice I didn't tell them we're teaching them how to handle cross-site scripting and SQL injection, which they probably also have to worry about, but they don't even understand the necessity of doing things like threat modeling I don't even know what threat modeling is. And it's incumbent on those of us who know to go over into their tribes, use their words, and help them get better sooner. So you might think of Microsoft 20 years ago versus Microsoft now. They went from hating researchers to researchers are a vital part of their R&D, and they treasure them, and they reward them with blue hat prizes and blue hat conferences and accolades and recognition and reward. Right? And the other big problem, which I'll skip for now, is basically the auto industry is really torn between do we fix the past or we fix the future, and the truth is they have to fix both, but they're erring on fixing the past instead of avoiding future mistakes. And I think our community is guilty of the same thing, so we might come back to that. But ultimately what caught their attention is even if they don't care about security, does anybody know what this picture is? The BP Deepwater Horizon, the oil spill that was on the news for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it, I think the last count was like $17 billion US in cleanup to date. 
17 billion with a B. Now, what I said to these guys, even if you don't think any hackers would ever get to you, what's more of a hit to your stock price or your public reputation, a software update or a factory recall? And the really telling part was I said, there's a remote kill switch vulnerability that most of them know about. Most of them are guilty of a similar flaw, if not the exact same one, where someone can remotely disable the vehicle because they're using insecure open source protocols in unpatchable systems that are remotely listening. And I said, if that happens to you tomorrow, and you're on the news tomorrow, are you going to be on the news for weeks like the BP oil spill? Or can you do a prompt and agile re you know, response? And the basic answer after about 30 seconds of no answer, because there are a bunch of competitors and they didn't want to be the first to speak, one of them said, well, let's just admit it. All the 2018 models are already done. So when I said what was the best case minimum response time, his first answer was the 2018s are already done. That's three years from now. And then someone else said it's actually worse than that because the Bosch and the Delphi's and the Harman Kardons that we put into those, they're done past 2018. So unless they have a remote update capability, they're basically hoping nothing bad happens because it's going to be a very costly, very time consuming response. And I haven't even talked about vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure, which is a nightmare. Right? So why did it jump out? <laughs> I had a crash. All systems fail. Okay. So what does this have to do while well, this is reloading? What does this have to do with continuous acceleration, with DevOps? I'll tell you in a moment. So we believe, to tie off the car stuff, we believe that uh, they're masters of their domain, we're masters of our domain, and now that cars are computers on wheels, our domains have collided, and we will have the safest outcomes as soon as if we work together and listen to how each other talk and prioritize things. Now, the mirror to that is I think now security more than ever can learn from the auto industry and in how we approach software. And I think the perfect opportunity for security and for rugged to inject themselves is through the DevOps movement and it's through a software supply chain. Now, where did I get this idea? Anybody know who that is? This is Deming, Edwards Deming. Edwards Deming is the godfather of lean software, godfather of agile, godfather of DevOps. They all know who he is. They worship him. Okay? But what they don't realize is he wasn't famous for writing software. He went to World War II Japan just after the war ended. The economy was destroyed. And after trying to get the US automakers in Detroit to use his process engineering ideas to make profitable vehicles, they ignored him, so he went to Japan, and what you now know as Toyota supply chain management comes from many of his principles. So he took a textile company, they didn't make cars, and he made them the most profitable, popular economic vehicle in the world. So because he understood how do you measure and enhance uh, things, the benefits of a software supply chain approach like Toyota are threefold. Um, if you, well, the, the methods of a software supply chain. Number one is you pick high quality suppliers, fewer high quality vetted suppliers. Number two, use the highest quality supply from those vetted high quality suppliers. And number three, you have the traceability and visibility throughout manufacturing process. So you know which parts went where. And that way if there's a bad brake pad or a bad airbag from Takata, you know exactly which vehicles got the, right, the wrong part and you can quickly respond. Now what that did is it was never designed to make safer cars. In fact, he went right after World War II, so it was several, it was two decades before the unsafe in any speed book and we had seat belt laws and all the other things with Ralph Nader and the Pinto and the Corvair. He designed that process not to make safer cars, but to make cars faster and more profitably. So these are things that developers like. So if you take a page from that and we start thinking about how that applies to software, let's put that into context. So Gene and I have put our heads together for about five or six years now. He saw that DevOps was going to destroy application security as you know it. I think uh, Matt Tassaro had a tombstone about you know, traditional AppSec is dead. Uh, and he was right, but it took a while to manifest. So we've been researching this for a while, and then finally at 2012, we convinced um, the RSA conference to let us do a talk on you know, security is dead, long live rugged DevOps, et cetera. Now it's been uh, an evangelism effort because it was very hard to get people to do this. They already thought Agile was reckless and irresponsible. They had no idea how bad it was going to be with DevOps. 
But over the years now, and this is fast forward to this year, we had a 700 person track at RSA. Uh, we ran a whole day thing they donated to us. We had speakers that are luminaries in the DevOps world. So these weren't security people talking about DevOps. These were DevOps people coming to our turf and we merged their tribe and our tribe. So the guy that wrote the continuous delivery book, Jez Humble, he's now joined the tribe and other people in their tribe have joined the tribe because they've realized that if they wanna go even faster and be even more profitable, they can't do it without streamlining and automating the software supply chain and streamlining and automating things like compliance and regulatory. So they're coming to us with open arms and now we're putting our, our minds together and he's saying, what the hell am I getting myself into? But, so we basically have settled on the term, not sec DevOps or DevOps sec, but the DevOps people think security is a downer. It's a cost and an inhibitor. So we are settling <laughs> on the term rugged DevOps, not because I want it that way, because they chose it, and I'm very pleased about that. But what we think is the best lowest hanging fruit to prove that we're not just the shrill hysterical person in the department of no, if you saw Frank's keynote, but that we can actually make them faster and more profitable, just like Deming told us. Because even though Agile and Lean took from Deming, they didn't take the full package. And if you take the full package, we're finally all gonna be happy. So let me put that into context. One of the ways we've gone faster is we use a ton of third party and open source code. And with that comes code bloat. That's why we have 100 million lines of code in a car. That's why the uh, Obamacare website has more lines of code than the Windows XP operating system. It has 11 different logging frameworks in one website. It takes five inputs, and yet it has more lines of code than an operating system. So some of this is that in our hurry to innovate and stand on the shoulders of giants, we've had a significant complexity growth and code, gro code bloat. Now, Gene likes to talk about technical debt in terms of the physical manifestation of a wiring closet, and that just like normal debt, technical debt accrues interest over time, and the same is true for security. So I go back to those incentives I started with, right? I've completely lost time on track of my time because my computer crashed, but, uh, or my PowerPoint crashed. What do developers care about? I know what I care about. I hope you answered your own question what you care about. But what do developers care about? Three things. They need to be on time, on budget, maybe with acceptable risk. And this is the priority order. Depending on how senior you are, you care just about the first or all three. If you think about enterprise architects, they're bonus and incentivized to be on time, on budget, which means I gotta go faster, I gotta be more profitable, and I have to have the quality my customers expect. In fact, they don't look at security as a discipline. It's a subset of quality as far as they're concerned. So we started with Waterfall, right? This was my first job. Terrible long cycles, you know? Um, painful, it took 36 months between releases. If I couldn't get a bug fixed in this release, I had to wait another year or two for a maintenance release. It was ridiculous. So Agile was born, and there's nothing more Agile than goats. Um, so Agile was born. Well, why was Agile born? Let's put it in the context of those three motivations. They, they want to go faster, they want to be more efficient, and they want to have acceptable quality and risk. Agile and continuous integration like Jenkins allowed you to compress the cycle times, to do more batches, smaller batches, between de uh, designing, developing, and testing. And that's where continuous integration happened. And it's allowed them to go much faster than Waterfall. Instead of releasing once every 16 to 18 to 36 months, you were releasing 10 times a year or more but it created shelfware. So what problem did DevOps solve for them? It's not just a buzzword. It may also be a buzzword. So even though it's Pandora's box, it is open. You can't put it back. Um, the problem that that solved is that fast streamlined shelfware within engineering needed to be extended into operations as well. So the dev people went into ops, the ops people went into dev. They figured out how to stop like hurting each other. The basic tension was that developers are bonus and incentivized to cause change and ops people are bonus incentivized to keep things stable, which usually infers preventing change. So when they gave a big hug and they used empathy and they figured out each other's uh, mistakes and optimization points, they were going even faster. They added continuous delivery and continuous deployment and or automation and orchestration tools like you've heard about today, like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, Rundeck. So they used these tools to streamline the human error prone things in ops and they were able to go faster and be more profitable. And the companies who have embraced this, whether they're Netflix, tiny companies on the West Coast, or they're large regulated organizations, are in fact crushing their competition because they're doing more with less. Their margins are higher. It's just a fact. Now, for those of you who think this is only for tiny companies, uh, Gene, run a, Gene ran a conference in the fall. He's about to run the second one. It was called DevOps Enterprise Summit. There were 50 speakers. All 50 came from Fortune 200 companies. 
highly regulated large old companies, including things like Disney, IBM, General Electric, and even parts of the US government, like the Department of Homeland Security, is doing DevOps. So it was an existence proof that this is not just for unicorns or irresponsible little startups anymore. This is an undeniable game changer. And if you're not availing yourself, you're basically falling behind on the evolutionary uh, path. But what they haven't fixed is the quality issues. And I think last year was the open season on open source, right? It was really the game changer where now people are aggressively targeting our shared dependence on the supply chain. And by doing so, we have some unpaid debt that has accumulated and the quality has begun to suffer. And moreover, what they've recognized even before the security vulnerabilities is they really can't go faster. They're kind of plateauing. They've gone as fast as they can in the gear that they're in. They need to shift to a higher gear and they haven't figured out what it is. And I'm about to give you the blueprint to doing it yourself, which is the software supply chains. So if you add the notion of high quality suppliers, high quality supply from high quality suppliers, and the traceability of which parts went where, very interesting things happen that allow you to go even faster than you could without it, have better operational proficiencies, and have acceptable quality and risk. So if you think about it, how did Heartbleed affect us? We called it a security reach, breach, right? We had a breach or an incident or some sort of risk, right? Those are the terms that we use as security guys. You know what a developer called it? Unplanned, unscheduled work, right? So if we go in there trying to say someone's gonna hack us, we have no credibility. But you know what they do care about? We, caught, we were six weeks late on our sprint because that stupid Heartbleed thing, we had to check 6,000 applications to see if we were using that vulnerable thing and it was painful, right? So that was unplanned, unscheduled work. They do care about that. In fact, they track how much unplanned, unscheduled work they have per year, especially at the enterprise architect level. What did an ops person call it? They call it a SEV1 outage. They didn't call it a breach. They had a service interruption. They're measured in bonus and incentivized to have five nines of uptime and availability. So their mo measurement was what's the mean time to repair, MTTR. So if we talk in terms of Heartbleed as a security risk, they don't care. If we say, that if we can help you reduce your unplanned, unscheduled work, would that be worthwhile? And they say, hell yeah. And if we say we can compress your mean time to remediate from six weeks to six minutes, because we already know which parts went where, and you don't have to test 6,000 applications in production, you test the 40 that you know have the vulnerable version, that's very attractive to them. So this is the one area where the safe thing to do is also the faster, more profitable thing to do. So let me just use a proof point from the Toyota Supply Chain book that has nothing to do with security. Just look at this slide for a moment, okay? They compared the Toyota Prius, an electric hybrid vehicle, to the Chevy Volt, which is an abject failure. It was 61% the price. So part of that's the result of their manufacturing process. They could get a lower price point. They sold 13 times as many vehicles. But pay really close attention to these next two. They built half as much of the car as their competitor did. So they did less work. But they did it with significantly fewer suppliers. Toyota only used 125 suppliers. Chevy used 800. So think of the extra management of the, and complexity of 800 suppliers versus 125. But that's not even the whole story. They were used 10 times better. So fewer of them used 10 times better. No wonder it was cheaper, higher quality, and better success in the market. In fact, that's not even the entire story. I've been told by people in the government that they, they had government subsidies, so they were actually losing $40,000 every time they sold one. So his true price was about $80,000. Now this was all about using fewer, better suppliers and having the traceability and visibility throughout the manufacturing process. So there's a strong case to be made that also happens to benefit us. Now I'm the custodian of Maven Central, so every time you grab vetted Java code, you're grabbing it from me. And we see a record explosion in the number of downloads. Last year we added 17 billion unique ones. It doesn't even count proxied requests, so it's a lot bigger than this. Some of this is exploding because of the internet of everything. Well, with that shared dependence, what does the attacker do? Why do, why do bank robbers rob banks? Because that's where the money is, right? So why would I attack a bespoke application for one bank, which is when I've cleaned them out, I'm done. Whereas instead, if I target Apache struts, I get every single bank. And this isn't a for example, this happened, right? My watershed moment was not Heartbleed. It was uh, seven, eight months prior when I was working at Akamai as the director of security intelligence. 
all my bank customers got a letter saying they were breached. And it was an, a vulnerability in Apache Struts 2, and it was on July something. And they systematically tried to figure out where am I using that vulnerable version, how can I migrate off of it. And some of them got reinfected because a few weeks later their commercial software vendors reinfected them because they too were using Apache Struts, but they didn't know it. So I looked and basically that bug had been there since at least the beginning of the Struts project, if not the web stuff before it, so about seven to 11 years. Now, as a security guy, I focused my eyes on Bouncy Castle. One of my defense contractor friends had been compromised because they were using a vulnerable version of Bouncy Castle. It's a cryptography API. Seven years ago, they had a severity, severity 10 flaw. Seven years ago, they fixed it. But our friend was not using the, the fixed version. So I went to look on day one at my consumption stats. 4,000 organizations are still using the, the bad one. Seven years later, it's been fixed, but no one knew it was broken. So no one applied the fix. They, put it in, they downloaded it 20,000 times, and they put it into about 650,000 applications. And many of them are governments and government contractors. Or social media platforms. This particular vulnerability made its way into vehicles. It made its way into industrial control systems. So they're using vulnerable versions of HTTP client, much like the bad crypto in the Mac. And they don't know it's broken, so they don't fix it. This isn't zero days. These are known vulnerabilities that are entirely avoidable. So if we're downloading bad parts and we're putting them through our machine and we're putting them into our build and deploy with, with known vulnerabilities at the start, this is an elective attack surface, elective complexity. It's entirely avoidable, unplanned, unscheduled work, entirely avoidable break fixes. And sometimes bad stuff happens. So when it does, would you like a faster mean time to repair? And when we've done surveys every year on the open source consumption, 75% of organizations don't even have a written policy about looking for known vulnerabilities in their software supply chain. And at this point in history, 90% of a modern application, including commercial ones, is assembled from third party and open source. We only write about 10% or less in modern applications writ large. There are some classes of exception. So I'll let you ogle at this later, but I mapped the redner response times with my CEO. IBM took 110 days to patch OpenSSL, and they patched 100 products at the same time. So you don't want to be high into the right on this, and I'm not picking on IBM. If you think about it, 110 days is actually a really damn good response time because it took IBM over a calendar year to fix the Apache Struts vulnerability that crippled all the banks. So I see this as a public health issue where people are not paying attention to the provenance, quality, or vulnerability of the open source they consume. They're putting it into their open source and closed source products. You're consuming them, and every time there's going to be a new heart bleed, it's going to affect a lot more people. We have no idea what we're looking at. So Dan Gear and I did a study for USENIX, and I looked at the consumption and health, so I'm going to pick on open source here for one minute. I wanted to know that when an open source project had a dependency on a vulnerable component, two questions, how often did they fix them, and how quickly did they fix them? And across the entire population, only 41% of the bugs ever get fixed, so there's terrible hygiene for known vulnerabilities amongst the open source projects themselves. And worse, it took 390 days for the MTTR. So there's a lot of room for growth here. Now, some logging frameworks fix all of their bugs within 90 days or so. Some of their logging frameworks fix none of their bugs. And right now, you're picking something without knowing the hygiene. So back to the point about picking fewer, better suppliers, if I could give you intelligence about which suppliers are worth your time and which ones are risky. Now, in the US, I'm picking a US thing not to be US-centric, but I think this has triggered international response. The UK government's planning to copy this. The insurance industry is probably the one that's going to do this. And already the banks are adopting it, even if it doesn't become law. But I've been working with my Congress to introduce a law that asks for three things. It's called the Cyber Supply Chain Transparency and Remediation Act. And it basically says anything sold to the federal government must provide a bill of materials of the third party and open source components used to construct it with their version numbers. So give a list of ingredients of the software there. Number two, that list should not contain known security defects and vulnerabilities for which a less vulnerable version is available. And number three, because future vulnerabilities are inevitable, you must have the ability to provide prompt and agile updates or updates in a timely manner. So tell us the ingredients that can't be known defective and they must be updatable. If you contrast that with Bouncy Castle, every single one of them, if they sell to the federal government or to a bank or if they want to get insurance, when they go to deliver their product, if there's a known vulnerability on that version of Bouncy Castle, they click over to the right, and they get the unbroken one. And it starts to drain the swamp. And if you don't think that this is important, I'm going to point out the, la the latest DBIR. Two little words, known vulnerabilities, okay? 
and I'll end here. If you haven't seen this chart from Michael Reutemann at RiskIO, he's a data scientist. He looked at the entirety of the data they could collect. 97% of the successfully exploited vulnerabilities in 2014 trace back to 10 known CVEs, eight of which have been patched for 10 to 12 years. There was only one of them from the last year. It was Poodle. In fact, if you look at the first three, three vulnerabilities constituted like 75, 80%. So these are not zero days. I'm not saying zero days aren't important. And I'm not saying SQL injection and cross-site scripting aren't important. But simply failing to use fixes for known vulnerable components has led to this. So if you don't know my H.D. Moore's law, you can look it up later. But basically, as sad as this is, I think this is the new order of operations for patching. If it has a logo, patch it today. If it's in H.D. Moore's law, which is if it's an active exploit in Metasploit, you have a 30 times more likely chance of it being ex exploited than if it's not. That's the stats from Michael's H.D. Uh, Moore, Moore's Law Proof. Then you can bother looking at CVSS in the context of your risk and mitigating factors before you start worrying about O-Days. Okay? They're important, but we're not doing a bit good enough job on our software supply chain hygiene. And it's in a time in our life when it matters a whole lot more than it used to. So I'm going to ask you guys, as scary as DevOps is, we're about to go on a boat and we can talk all we want on the boat, as scary as DevOps is, or as newfangled as it sounds, do we want to spend all of our time on the past and prior models? Or are we ready to challenge ourselves to figure out better ways to use empathy, find teammates, drive business value? One easy way is software supply chains so that we can start to make cars, medical devices, and the internet of everything a little bit safer for you and your family. Ask me what this is on the boat. Uh, I thank you for your time.